Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here speaking about a topic that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, before I call my fellow panelists up onto the stage, I'm just going to set the context for the, this conversation today. I believe this is possibly one of the most important topics that we can discuss when it comes to overcoming inequality in Africa. Today, um, our panel is exceptional, and they are here to discuss how we can harness Africa's human capital to drive sustainable development and bridge educational disparities. As we know, Africa has the largest and fastest growing youth population, and it will contribute over a third of the global workforce by 2050. This demonstrates the capacity to, um, in, in terms of human resources to really, really trigger economic growth in Africa. In 2023 alone, 45 million children were born across the continent, and without access to quality education, most, most of these children will not reach their full potential. The fact is that only 42% of African children will complete secondary school, and less than one in 10 will enroll in tertiary education, drastically limiting their economic opportunities. The children in quintiles one and two, um, whose parents earn below 65 pounds dollars a month, um, have only a 5% chance of entering tertiary education, compared to 15 to 25% in quintile four, and 50 to 60% in quintile five. This demonstrates a significant gap in the access to opportunity. Despite primary school um, enrollment increasing to over 80%, the completion rate for secondary school remains low, and Africa's gross tertiary enrollment rate is only 9.4%, global average of 38%. Addressing these disparities requires targeted policies, innovative financing, and quality education to ensure that Africa's human capital does not become a lost opportunity. So today, we have some of the greatest minds, capital, and policymakers in one room to address these challenges and look at how, how to transform Africa's latent human capital into a powerful engine for economic growth. Our panel will explore how education from early childhood through to tertiary can be leveraged to equip Africa's youth with the skills and opportunities needed to um, drive sustainable development. So we are going to dive into this incredible topic. And with that context set, I would like to welcome to the stage our three panelists. First, Sandeep Anija, um, Managing Partner at Kaizenvest. Dr. Eugene van Rensburg, CEO and co-founder of EduInnovate. And Nell Lemestre, Director of Organizational Development at Chanson International. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> okay. Right. Come, come, come a little closer. Okay. <laughs> oh, close. This is okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, I'm looking forward to some really interesting conversation today. I've asked our panelists to input into each other's questions as well because I think that'll make for a more lively debate. So before we get going, I'd like you each to just introduce yourself um, and give us the context of why education is the one thing that keeps you up at night. So, Nell, let's start off with you. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Nell. Um, I'm the Director of Organizational Development at Chanson International. And first, I want to tell you a little bit about Chanson International and then about my background and finally why education. So Chanson International is on a mission to increase the lifetime income of excluded youths in Africa. And we operate in South Africa, Kenya, and Rwanda with a pilot in Ghana uh, currently. And the way we do that is through uh, providing ethical financing for tertiary education so that it leads to sustainable employment. So what we finance can range from a four-year engineering degree to a 12-week coding boot camp. As long as it leads to good employment and sustainable income, this is what we're interested in doing. So we're really bridging the gap between education and employment. And in terms of my background, so I have a bit of mixed background in strategy consulting, product innovation, and more recently leading programs uh, for NGOs and social enterprises. But there's always been a thread of education through that. So I've worked with the LEGO Foundation on inclusive education. I've worked with a number of organizations internationally on early childhood education, all through to later schooling um, and inclusion again. So I have a range of perspectives, but really education for me is extremely important because it has that multiplier effect. Um, it's the root of so much more potential impact. So for me, it's one of the most exciting places to, to be sat. Thank you, Now. Eugene. Um, you, Dr. Eugene von Rainsburg. I am a first generation postgrad in my family. And so I know what the transformative power is of education, not only for myself, but friends, family, and the community. And so it's with that passion that I 
I embarked on this journey. I'm also here to say that I believe education has a real commercial investment opportunity um, and should be seen differently from the traditional philanthropic approach. I think there is a market out there that is desperate for the right innovation and the right access to quality education and, and, and product. And I think it needs to be on the stage with, alongside all of the, the other 20 year long term bonds that we've heard things about. So um, Edu, Edu Innovate or Education Innovation Partners, we founded it uh, with a purpose of being an investment holding company for education technology businesses with a very key strategy. Um, our vision is to reimagine solutions to transform education in Africa at scale. And how we do that is we focus on partnering with a teacher in the classroom for their success. We believe that in order to uplift the communities, our, our starting point has to be what is needed to be successful in a classroom for a teacher. And we use the teacher as a bit of a metaphor where a teacher can be an auntie or an uncle or a grandfather or grandmother. It can be a tutor and often actually it can be a peer. And so there's a learning process that needs to happen and access um, is the opportunity. So Another thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Sandeep. Thank you, Meg. So I'll start with uh, who I am and why education is so interesting to me, and then talk about my work and at Kaizen Best. So I'm uh, a son of two parents who were both refugees, and uh, both of them taught themselves uh, when they're the only college graduates from their families, and that's because they had to spend their own capital studying and learning at the same time, studying and working at the same time. So education was sort of in my blood. My mother was uh, an entrepreneur in education. She ran a school throughout, as far as I, as I remember her. And I was her uh, uh, most difficult student in early childhood. And it's important to me because uh, that was transformative uh, for me and for me as an individual, as a parent. And we learned the power of education throughout. I was also her favorite tutor for her most difficult children as I grew up, so I enjoyed tutoring. And in college, I used our scholarship income to start an adult education program for factory workers and their spouses in the town I went to college in. And that was just fun for me. It wasn't, it wasn't something special. It was a good use of my time. So it's nothing, it's just something that I took for granted that education was important to me and would be important to everybody, and I still do. So I started off my career as a venture capitalist in the Bay Area, did tech investing, and uh, parenthood children and their education needs brought the whole need to learn education all over again. So we uh, started an education fund for India, the first one to do so, and then we graduated to Asia, and then we do a that was pure tech venture capital, non-tech venture capital fund, as you would imagine. That was what I learned as my first art. Then we graduated to Africa and relearned everything all over again. And we had to change the nature of capital. We had to apply private credit with blended finance and focus on different opportunities, much more solving for access. And now we do a bit more innovation work in Singapore for Asia and US for US also because there are several access gaps in the US. So it's pretty global for me and I enjoy what we do because uh, this is fulfilling at the end of the day. It can change lives, so I think that's why we're all here. Thank you. Absolutely, changing lives. Mm -hmm. So let's start with content and delivery. If we were to design the ultimate curriculum for the future, and I'm gonna direct this one at you, um, Nell, because of your background in venture building, incubation, and product development. Um, so my question to you is what key elements would you prioritize in the curriculum and delivery methods to ensure inclusivity and adaptability for the ne next generation? And specifically, how can African schools prepare students with the necessary skills and competencies to thrive in an ever-evolving global landscape? What do we put in the curriculum? Amazing, yeah. So I think the, the ideal future ready school, if you were to design it, really needs to start with the, the demand. And for me, that starts with jobs. So what is the job market going to look like, not even tomorrow, but in the next five years? And we know that we have multiple revolutions happening in the job market between AI redefining or completely rendering obsolete certain industries, 
um, the climate challenge presenting new specialized jobs to the market, there's a number of evolutions that are happening rapidly and which represents both a threat and an opportunity for schools to respond. So I think in terms of curriculum, it's really looking to the future and thinking, we don't even, it's not even about playing catch up in terms of quality and material, it's about playing prediction mm -hmm. to try and get the right content in. And I think we've learned across the years um, that there needs to be more of a focus on skills rather than themes or topics as well. So what types of creative thinking, critical thinking, teamwork, leadership um, skills can we bring into schools and what are the right methods for that? And more and more we're realizing that the right methods are around engaging the students in creating and in applying. So it's less about ingesting uh, content and more about working with the content and playing with it, which is a true human quality and human nature. So it's really playing to that is how I would see the ideal curriculum and delivery method. But I think none of this would matter if you didn't have access um, as well. So just ensuring that there is access to education and at every level, which includes tertiary level as well. So each time thinking about what are the barriers financially um, to access and designing the, the models for financing, as we've all been thinking about, to ensure that there are people in seats and it's not this type of ideal future ready school is accessible to everyone and not just those who can afford it. Yeah, so looking at the core competencies of creativity and, and so on that'll fit the jobs of the future. I love that. Opening it up to the, other, the rest of the other two, um, any thoughts on the content and delivery method? Well, I think it's, uh, uh, to me, education is a part of a bigger social solution of inequities. And uh, it is standalone on its own. It's a difficult cause to pursue. It needs to be looked at from our perspective. This is my version 3.0 argument. Version 1.0 was, let's improve education. Version 2.0 was, let's make the world a better place through education. Ver version 3.0, as I get into learning about what we do and why we do it, is can we solve real deep social problems through education? And if we don't do that, we are taking uh, an incomplete approach. But socially, at this point, the biggest challenge is unemployed youth globally. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get worse, as uh, you said, Nell. So if we solve this, it has to be a solution that involves content and teacher centricity and the right use of technology. It is not overused or uh, it has to be pertaining to local infrastructure as well. And therefore it's uh, very local, it solves a local problem. Okay. Yeah, so from our perspective, we, we look at content um, as from a demand driven perspective. So. For us, it's really important to create that platform at scale to have reach into the communities of teachers and learners um, and providing that access point. And I think what's important there is we work in both a analog and a digital world in an African and rest of world content uh, context. I think we always think that only Africa's got infrastructure problems, uh, many, many other jurisdictions too. But having lived in Africa and still live in Johannesburg, um, operated in Kenya, and Zambia and region, um, there are many obvious challenges, and I think the cost hurdle always comes up in terms of how do we access these markets. But part of reimagining means we've got to take away some of the assumptions, and we've got to start attacking um, those. And so delivering digital and analog content in order to digitally augment a teacher infrastructure mm -hmm. is possible through very interesting creative means. Satellite over IP is yeah. it's one of the, the mechanisms we use. Um, being able to drive that delivery process. Now, what is critical, what uh, you mentioned earlier, is how do we help the learner uh, in a competence-based curriculum uh, engage with project-type work? You need the educator to be present in the room to be able to facilitate that. And if we're not taking away some of the burdens that the educators have from an administrative perspective and some of the shortcomings in terms of um, skill set or, uh, or just capacity, we're not going to be able to create those env learning environments. And so having a dedicated focus around an educator or a teacher gives us the ability to provide curated content or curated curriculum, provide a workflow and, a, and an engagement for the teacher that gives them the time and capacity in the classroom <coughs> to focus because the classroom is, is complex. And so you also have teachers having to deal with neurodiversity, their own and that of the children. 
they have to deal with um, malnutrition, they have to deal with family, family dynamics, etc. And so by having all of this overwhelming process of preparation, content creation, flow, etc., and then administration at the end, because funding doesn't come if we're not accountable, we're not presenting it. And so that is where technology does play an important role. Mm. But technology not at the cost of the analog physical world. And so it is an interaction between the two that yeah. can enable some really exciting stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, we always talk about high touch and high tech, and I think that's what you're alluding to with the analog and digital. Um, and that analog high touch is just so important in, in anything informing a human, human being, you know, relationship context. But it's not terribly scalable because you've got one teacher to a multitude of children that you know, massive demand. So we're having to look at technology. One of the difficulties in Africa, and you've all kind of alluded to a little bit, is, is the infrastructure um, that we battle with um, in Africa. So, um, Sandeep, this one for you. In many African countries, infra infrastructure limitations do present a significant barrier. And given these constraints, how can we design scalable technology solutions that remain effective in areas with limited digital access and resources? Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's, May I change the assumption a little bit and broaden the assumption? My assumption is that infrastructure is a challenge, but not the biggest one. We've seen it in uh, many countries in Asia. So I'll apply some of those lessons we've learned, which are counterintuitive, and I would love to test those counterintuitive theories in Africa as we go deeper. It's easy to assume infrastructure challenges will be the main challenge. What we've learned in Asia in some of the most difficult geographies, let's say the Philippines, thousands of islands, uh, difficulty in access to education from a cost and distance perspective, technology perspective, and COVID perspective, and everything broke down. So what did we do with high investment? We were of the opinion that we were unable to access the uh, 120,000 students who were learning in our college system because of technology they were not able to come to college because they were hurting emotionally. When they came to college, they were uh, only 1% of our college entrants in that system, which caters to the very bottom, were college ready. Most were learning at sixth grade levels, most. So the biggest achievement in the first year for this institution chain was to take students from a uh, level of sixth, seventh grade learning up to college readiness within one year. So they packed a lot. But what they've learned over the last 14 years is the biggest thing that they had to solve for was self-confidence and the desire and the belief that by learning they could change their lives. Once they instill the desire and the belief that by learning you can change your life and you could actually improve that of the society and that is important for you to do, the students just learn like sponges. You have to make solutions available. So that's now that's a very esoteric philosophical thought process. Sounds beautiful and very impactful. It is true. So I think the, the deepest infrastructure you need to target is the person's belief that they need to learn and can do better. So that's super high touch, super unscalable, super necessary. If you cannot invest in door-to-door -door advocacy of learning, uh, it is the biggest infrastructure hurdle you will face, in my opinion. I have yet to test it in parts of Africa. That's an opening hypothesis. Second, technology is super important, but there are solutions around it. It's a much easier infrastructure challenge to overcome with the right dial version of technology. It's a combination of human effort and technology. What did we solve for in the Philippines when this situation, when COVID hit? We drop shipped books home. And we got every student a mobile device, which we paid for. A lot of them had it. And we worked with the carriers so that we could get at least LTE connection to homes on those phones, and the carriers absorbed the cost. So we created a consortium in emergency. It's, if it is such an emergency in your region, then you solve for it as if it is an emergency until it is solved. So you've got to have a consortium of providers. You cannot be working in isolation as an education provider. You've got to solve for just enough technology, just enough drop-in mail stuff, just enough human motivation so you get the triggers ready to learn and to teach. I think that is the way I think about it, so yeah. Love it. 
Um, really, really interesting. And I am completely on your page with igniting that fire and that desire to learn. Uh, you know, just overcoming that is a huge thing. I'm in the, I work in the ECD space, mm. and play-based learning is, is really what, you know, what is the key to that. So getting yeah. kids playing early in a curriculum that really fires their imagination, their creativity, and their love for learning early on. Um, and if we get that right in the early years, then we're not going to have to spend that time that you've had to spend on actually igniting their fire to ov overcome that first yeah. before they've got the will to learn. So ab yeah. absolutely 100% on your page. Um, Eugene, um, you are s have line of sight to some very interesting businesses, I'm sure, as, as you start to look to build your fund um, and the type of businesses that are going to go into your business. Can you give us a line of sight of, of some of those and, and, and where, how you think they will move the needle in this Certainly. space? So I think um, what's critical here is your, uh, the scale that we need to achieve is creating essentially sparking hope in the community. Um, and hope in the community starts with change agents. Yeah. And hence our fo very much focus on leveraging and empowering and enabling teachers. In terms of businesses, and I'm going to go practical on a couple of mm. things that we've seen, actual solutions. So one of, one of our proof of concepts is in the Philippines. Um, where we, the hypothesis was, can one create a workflow for a teacher with a particular curriculum defined by um, an external party where a teacher can facilitate a class of more than 60 to 80 children yeah. and the learning outcomes measurably different or better? Um, that was the hypothesis. And can we do this in a, in a disconnected world? So the, th the theory was all great. Um, the product owner found an, an island in the Philippines. The last eight hours of his 36-hour journey was um, across the ocean in the, on a little raft with a two-stroke motor. Um, and uh, when they arrived at the island, very, very small school, uh, there were 65 children in the class, one teacher, one assistant, and the learning outcomes had improved by 30% um, over that period of time because the teacher was more available to the children in the classroom has the ability to identify both in an analog and in a digital world where those are who are excelling and those that are falling behind and those in the in the middle of the pack um, that extended to proof of concept to a school in southern africa where essentially the statistics are as follows so there's a hundred children in the class there's one senior teacher there's one se uh, there's one teacher assistant who then becomes the future teacher um, and one administrative assistant um, those three people are then able to manage both the personality differences and learning differences of the 100 children in the class. And comparatively, from a cost perspective, they're able to provide that learning or tuition for 1,000 euros per learner per year. Um, and their average pass rate in grade 12 or in AES levels uh, equivalent is 90% plus of the students pass with a... Um, uh, suitable, qualifica uh, suitable qualification to go to university. In comparison, the public system in the same space um, offers classes with 50 to 70 children sometimes in the classroom, one teacher, no specific process. Um, it costs about 1,750 euros per annum per learner, and the outcome at grade 12 level is 23 to 25% pass rate. Mm. And so I think that's where we really have to start reimagining and rethinking things because there's certain assumptions. Quality, we don't have enough teachers, we don't have enough infrastructure. We have to accept that. We can build it, it takes time, but we can work with what we have. And so providing tuition to the educator just in time, both from a subject matter expertise perspective as well as the emotional intelligence perspective, not only facilitates learning for the teacher, mm. but also for the classroom. And so doing that subtly, I believe we can do some really interesting <coughs> things. And in that Philippines example, we have an Intel Nook with a um, solar panel and a satellite connection mm. to provide the connectivity. Because, so new to your point, it's expensive to have data, but if your data only has to be a username and password, yeah. it's kilobytes. And if you can then have a community around <laughs> a school with up to a thousand concurrent Wi-Fi users, it creates this sense of togetherness yeah. and it's, it's that starts sparking hope. Uh, what we've also seen in practical terms is communities then start looking after that infrastructure and they start celebrating mm -hmm. it. And um, one of our team built a private school in a, in a township area mm -hmm. and um, 
everyone thought this would never work, firstly, because uh, of theft, violence, all the other, all the other matters. Um, the school was oversubscribed. Um, it has its own security, thanks to the community. Um, and the community is now uh, pushing to get more, more land assigned to them by the government to provide more schooling like that. So I think it, as with all meaningful opportunities and meaningful um, things to do, it starts by the first step. And you were talking about um, emergency in, in COVID. Sorry, I go back to global financial crisis suddenly. <laughs> My financial background. But in COVID, we all pulled together. Pearson, um, Pearson and uh, Penguin Random House, everyone gave free access to content. I'd like to argue we don't need to wait for COVID. We have 550 million learners in Africa mm. under the age of 18. And in the current system, 30% of those never get to schooling. Um, of the 70% that goes into the system, our average rate is 23 to 25% graduation. So actually we have a crisis. We have 400 million unskilled people coming into the workforce. Um, and so if that's not worthy of attention, yeah, I'm what not is? sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I'd actually like to go a little off piece because, Nell, I know that you're seeing some really interesting innovations as well coming through Chanson. Can you give us an idea of some of the innovations that have really excited you in the, in the education space? Yeah, I think the examples are probably more from my past accelerator programs. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about especially like how do you leverage the technology that's already there and you bridge that analog digital world mm -hmm. um, as we were speaking about. One of them was um, in Tanzania, a company called Ubongo. Um, which provides educational content through the channels that already exist. So radio, TV, they even print materials and send them out. And there's an app for those who actually have the smartphone, but it's not necessary. And the whole point of doing that was to provide education in a way that was audiovisual so that um, you could overcome the barrier to uh, illiteracy, for example. So what I really like is that there's different actors moving into different spaces to ensure that there's an overall um, an overall solution to, to, to education. Uh, another one I had the, the chance to work with was called Darcel, and they provide supplementary uh, math teaching and math, tra math training, but through WhatsApp and through Messenger, so that you know, it's, it's already there on the phones, it's not an additional app, it's low bandwidth, so again, the barriers to access are lower. And maybe the, the final example I'll provide is that of One Billion, another uh, organization I had the chance to work with, which has a, a big partnership with the government of Malawi, but works internationally as well. Um, and they provide tablets that are loaded up with a software that helps with um, uh, numeracy and literacy uh, teaching, but it does so in an adaptive manner. So there's no need for someone to log in to have an account. The system automatically learns in a matter of minutes what the level of the person is and then adapts the training to that. And that's beautiful because that means it can be used across schools in a really flexible manner. Um, and it requires less updates, uh, again, less bandwidth, it's on the, the tablet, it's preloaded. Um, and so these sorts of solutions really give me hope because it's really smart people seeing the problem and tackling it in an innovative ways. Mm -hmm. And I think by building onto those and leveraging them through partnerships, through consortiums, you can actually address the problem of infrastructure, of illiteracy, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, incredible. And a lot of that innovation will be coming, obviously, out of the private sector and startups. Um, and of course, they'll be looking to and deep and Kaiser invests for investments. So you've probably seen quite a few of those companies come across your desk. Um, what are you seeing as more creative ways of actually funding these businesses? And, and, and how can we work with this ecosystem to stimulate growth in, in the sector, in the startup sector? Well, it's a great question. And I think it goes to one thesis that we follow, which is alignment. Alignment of the problem, which is if you're solving a huge problem like access, massive, you need to raise massive amounts of capital. Uh, if you're solving access in a, in a situation where you cannot see returns for a while, then you better have blended finance available to you and lots of it, so you work with the government for that. You can't do it alone. If you're solving for quality, it exists, but not of great quality. You need to improve it. The capital amount needed is smaller, but you're solving for a lot of teacher intervention time, a lot of repeat, uh, repeat training, you know, personalization of learning through AI, et cetera, and therefore, you can actually apply venture capital principles to that, where you can get growth. Uh, so the issue that we are seeing is a lot of capital is not well aligned to the solution. So in our opinion, at this stage, when we are discovering innovative solutions, and they are, none of them is really at scale, 
what makes sense is to not put additional pressure on that uh, on those solutions now let them experiment and the experimentation that occurs in a market that's super dense with a lot of potential customers who have the ability to pay and that's very clear such as luck you know any in many markets you can come in with a traditional venture capital market uh, model where diversification from the perspective of the investor is super important but if you do not see a thousand companies of the same type of which you select 10 one is 200 selection ratio in a good day then it is hard to apply the venture capital model so what do you apply you still have to support those companies and that is where Africa EdTech is today. It is not a thousands of companies that I'll see in a, in a year. Since I won't see that, which are possible likely investees, I will look at blended finance, which would be more patient, allow experimentation, come in with uh, first loss capital, come in with TA support, transaction advisory support, such that companies can use that to experiment operating models, exper experiment with technology models, fail, learn, pick up, Instead of scaling in three years, scale in eight years. That's okay. But once they scale after two to three years, then they start paying us an interest income. We do not seek, because the cost of capital, of venture capital is 20%. Interest can be very low. But it, interest puts in the fiscal discipline that's needed to manage cash flow. So we come in with uh, an instrument that locally doesn't challenge the scalability or the growth ability of the solution, comes in with the patience that's needed so the solution can scale through experimentation. So we do Interesting. that. Interesting. And I'm sure you're looking for some measurable outcomes yes. when, when you're <laughs> investing. And that sits in your domain, Eugene. Um, what sort of measures or, or what are the most effective ways for us to measure success that in, in a way that both satisfies impact, which is obviously what this is all about, but also the investor expectation? I, I'm going to answer differently. I think First, satisfy, first, it has to satisfy a commercial rationale. Um, it attracts the right capital and the right fiscal discipline, that Sandeep mentioned now. Um, because I find in most of my investment conversations, there is an, an element of, okay, but how do you make money? And is this, like, is this philanthropy? Mm -hmm. you know, and you go, no, and so I spend half my time helping guide the conversation into this. So there's a real commercial reality here. And the excitement for me is the, the, there is the, the patient capital element of it, but the, there's the impatient um, entrepreneur in me that says, um, if we have five summers until a certain, for five years, there's only five summers and five winters, right? So we've got a few seasons to affect change. Um, having the Having too little capital makes entrepreneurs make poor decisions, both ethically and product-wise. Um, but having too much capital makes one complacent. Mm. And so the, having that right tension is important. So having a blended capital model is critical, mm. but not to, the ex not to the exclusion of a really strong, focused economic commercial model, mm. um, which then has other benefits to it. And so um, in terms of measurement and how do we look at accountability, We've got to start by having the data. If you look at, um, so in an African context, so to give you comparatives, uh, Process, the, the Dutch investment firm, has just short of $4 billion worth of investments into EdTech mm. with just short of $500 million of ARR. Mm. Now, the two largest uh, uh, Af African EdTech businesses have got a combined ARR of less than $20. Um, not because there aren't opportunities and solutions, it's just so fragmented and it's so underfunded. And hence where we come in, we're saying we believe that attracting the right responsible capital into the space will build the ecosystem of a really strong platform with already 10 million users and learners active. So measuring it needs we, means we need the data. By focusing on the educator or the teacher, we start collecting that data. And we can start proving um, on an ongoing basis, the impact of, of interventions. Because the other challenge is, um, in order for me to say that, these, the funnel of children entering ECD to graduating in AS levels or grade 12, that's a 12 year long, you know, it's, it's a long study. <laughs> yeah. And so what we have done is we've worked very closely with the World Bank Education Economist team 
um, looking at the work that they have in place, the research they have in place, what are the, the cost metrics. They've got it down to a cost metric per learner, per grade in grade 12 um, perspective. And so there's really good um, metrics that we can leverage already if we had the right distribution and the right user end base to start collecting that on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. And so key things are around um, attendance, educators. So if we can measure how many educators are just uplifted and actually retained in the system, mm -hmm. there's a lot of teachers leaving because of underpay and stress and complications. So there are really key metrics we can, we can look at. One of the other run, uh, run rates or um, scoreboards is, of course, investor return. If we can demonstrate the, the ability for investors to have a diversified portfolio investment that creates sustainable 20% dollar IRRs, um, we should be able to track the right capital to, to refocus on an African continent. Um, yeah. Great metrics, I love that. Um, Nell, I'm going to redire redirect to you now, and um, we've spoken a lot about startups here and that they're innovating, and of course that's a big piece of education, is actually to get those problem-solving minds coming through in the youth for the, for the 2050 workforce. Um, what, do you what have you seen, or what do you, what do you think about um, we, what we need to put into curriculums to in in improve and encourage entrepreneurship? Yeah, I, uh, I love that question because I do love entrepreneurs. I've been working with them um, for the past years and I actually share my life with one of them. So I think that the thing about entrepreneurial mindset is that I truly believe that some people have and some people don't. And it's okay to be one or the other. Yeah. But the problem right now in our education system is that we don't recognize the potential and, the, and that being an entrepreneur is a good viable path. So currently we tend to either ignore or punish entrepreneurs in schools. Um, because the way that we measure success in schools is very much the other type of mind, which is a mind that is going in the same direction as everyone else and builds in quality. Entrepreneurs tend to be quite different from that and find nonlinear ways to solve problems and can be on yeah, divergent paths of think thinking. So I think first and foremost, we need to build the measures of success in schools that recognize entrepreneurs and we need to help entrepreneurs discover, discover themselves. So actually, I self-identify as being really good at those things that are creative, um, that are meaningful and have impact straight away rather than being long-term and patient uh, as you go through the employment sector. So there's something to be done there around identifying and encouraging it. I think, again, it comes back to inclusion because being an entrepreneur also is a factor of what conditions do you have around you that permits you to take risks. Um, and I've seen great ways for schools to minimize that risk by offering like a project-based way of starting within the education system uh, some initiatives, which is great. But once people leave school and consider the tertiary education uh, pathway or starting something pathway, we need to have the right type of financing to support that. So um, I don't have the perfect answer and I think there's multiple uh, financing available. I know that at Chanson we've supported a lot of entrepreneurs and we're so happy to see their success now. <laughs> Um, but I think for us it has been a matter of financing their education up front so that this cost wouldn't be uh, a barrier to them to start something on the side. Um, and then it's been finding the right pathways for them and, and supporting them on that. Um, but that's only one type of financing. I know there's a lot more considerations when you're becoming an entrepreneur. But, yeah. that kind of but what a great answer. Um, that divergent thinking that we try and, you know, in the education systems traditionally have tried to keep everybody on exactly the same path because it's easier to educate everybody with a kind of one size fits all approach. And that doesn't work for entrepreneurs. So I just think that that is an incredibly useful perspective. We've only got five minutes left, and I would love to take a question, but I'm going to give you a final question that, um, for, for you all to answer. You have a room of leaders, funders, policymakers, and some startups, I'm sure. What do you ask of them as they consider how to educate Africa's latent human capital to become the engine of our continent's economic growth? What do you ask of them? What's the next steps? Uh, it's a pretty tough question to answer, right? Uh, I think one of the things we could benefit from is guided collaboration between all entities coming together. Now, that's a very idealistic vision to say we, the government, the policymakers, innovators, accelerators, uh, society, parents, everybody comes together. Um, I think creating the, a system whereby you, know, you will never celebrate education. Uh, 
uh, I'll give you a visual that you can imagine. I show up at a conference where we're talking about biodiversity uh, or climate change. It hits you really quick. When biodiversity hits you positively, you see these beautiful rainforests with clouds, mists all over the place. Like, wow, this is beautiful. I'd love to see that be sustained. You, climate change, you see fires everywhere. You see floods and say, wow, I need to stop that. I need to invest in it. Very stark, very visual, very immediate. Education change is super slow. There is no visual for it. The visual that you often see is the wrong visual of unhappy children. You need to feed them food and all. Well, how can you inspire investors? How can you inspire governments and society to say, this is where 80% of my capital needs to go. When the fire is bigger, when the floods are bigger, when the forests are much bigger and vis visibly much more appealing, positively or negatively. So one of my objectives, and this is something I've taken upon myself, and with a foundation we're working in South, uh, Southeast Asia, is to glorify education. Really make it so visually attractive, visibly attractive, that we turn attention towards it. People pay attention and their money to things they see much more than things which are invisible and slow. You've seen that example of a gorilla walking through a game mm -hmm. and the gorilla is walking through slowly, people are dancing, and nobody sees the gorilla because it's walking slowly. It is funny, but that's, that's how we are. We don't perceive slow change. So we need to bring fast change attention to education and I would love for all of us to think of that as a way to change. How can I attract a teacher when I don't even promise her? I can retain her with salary, but I can't attract her with salary. I've got to attract her with a life-changing dream or something that's more deeply meaningful, like it's, she's super respected in society to be a teacher. Bring that to the table, then we are talking about a system which competes with other jobs which are super attractive from not just money. People will leave money for respect. People will leave money for self-actualization. We need to create that dream. If we don't create it, we'll fail in the system. Absolutely, we need to romanticize that dream for sure. Yeah. I love it. I, I shared with quickly Meg from you, uh, Eugene. Yeah, I shared with Meg and uh, some of the audience earlier that my journey with this started with asking why is there not an Emmys for the teachers at the end of the year? Yeah. Yeah. Why are we not celebrating? Mm -hmm. um, and I believe we can create both intrinsic and extrinsic rewards outside of salary yeah. for teachers through the right system um, and, and creative platforms. Um, what would we want uh, the investors and policymakers to bring to the table? An open mind and the vision of the following. We spoke about the large uh, African dividend or the people in, in an African context. Um, but imagine a future where you have an upwardly mobile middle income group that is from emergent from a population of 4 billion people, mm -hmm. currently 1.5 billion. Um, imagine you have a skill set that you can resource your own domestic economies from, uh, from a teacher, plumber, electrician, nurse, um, doctor perspective. Um, imagine a space where you have an African continent as your business partner, not just a provider of natural resources, both labor and mineral. And so I think there's an opportunity to look at it very differently and in changing that, um, that mindset, the other things solve for itself. Um, I think that communities and resourcefulness is incredibly important. And in a uh, last sort of analogy quickly is, we spoke about Lego Foundation earlier, or you mentioned Lego Foundation earlier. Lego is kind of seen as the, an education tool. Um, there's a Lego Foundation project called Lego Six Bricks. It uses six two by four bricks to teach early childhood development programs. And um, a question to the audience, and we don't have much time, but if you take six Lego bricks, two by four, which is the original Lego interlocking brick mm. that was patented, you just take six of them and you build shapes. Now you have either one shape where they're all apart or one shape where they're all together and then various combinations of that. How many shapes do you think you can build with six Lego bricks? You may know the answer. I actually don't buy notes in <laughs> this number. <laughs> so, so pick a number. I mean, it's 240. So, so 915,103,000 and some change. Um, <laughs> so the message there is 
think of human resourcefulness and creativity in the context of six Lego bricks. The simple things that we've spoken about at this panel can come together with a community and build a near infinite uh, number of outcomes. Yeah, thank you, Eugene. And over to you now. I can't top that, that was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think I was just so inspired by um, something you said earlier, so mine would be question the assumption. Mm. I think sometimes we rush to uh, solve a problem when actually if you unbundle it or if you look to the roots, you, you can discover that there is another path to it. So there is a sense of urgency that we feel when we see a problem, we're gonna tackle it immediately, but I think there's so many case studies, so much experience out there that we can learn from to actually spot what is the biggest lever of change um, and not try and tackle everything at once, but really focus on the things that will change. Mm -hmm. so I really love it. What an inspirational panel. Thank you to you three. Incredible insights, incredible learnings, and I hope that everybody else has enjoyed it as much as I have. Africa has the opportunity to leapfrog traditional and not for fit for purpose education systems in the Western world. And to participate, we need creative, innovative thinkers who are not scared to fail. And I think that's what it's all about. So thank mm. you very much for what you do. You've done Thanks. well, Meg. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.